everybody. Welcome back. I'm Jessica, Executive Director of Wild Cumberland. And I'm Devin, a Wild Cumberland volunteer. We appreciate you being here. We start every single podcast episode with the same reminder. Our monthly email newsletter is the very best way to stay up to date on issues affecting Cumberland Island and its wilderness. So if you haven't already, go to wildcumberland.org and get yourself signed up. In today's episode, we're covering the highlights from a recent interview with Superintendent Trenchick from the Camden County Tribune Georgian. We also recap our recent virtual learning session about the Blake Plateau and we're providing some horse litigation updates, everyone's favorite. September is a really important month around here, actually. Um, Let me mention, this is also our podcast anniversary. I don't know if you realize that we've been doing this for an entire year. Yeah, officially. So congratulations to us for our consistency, (laughs) and thanks to you all for listening. Um, But it's also September is the 60th anniversary of the 1964 Wilderness Act, and it's National Wilderness Month. Um, And of course, Cumberland Island Wilderness was officially designated in September also. So... Big month. It's a big deal around here. (laughs) It actually is. Um, And so in this month's newsletter, we reflected a little bit on the complexity of Cumberland Island's wilderness and how that was acknowledged by President, former President Ronald Reagan um, in a statement. So you can read that and reflect. I think it's kind of important. Have you ever read that statement before? I ha- so I use you as all of my uh, wilderness and um, just environmental um, news and everything. <laughs> you know, I searched some myself, but I just learned so much from you, Jess. But I hadn't until you put it in here. Um, can I read it for our listeners? Yeah, I think you should. Cool. So it says... In light of the conflict between the requirements to manage the island in accordance with the Wilderness Act and to protect valid existing rights, I am directing the Department of the Interior to manage Cumberland Island in a manner similar to wilderness to the maximum extent practicable, consistent with the other issues of the area set forth in the legislative history. And that is from President Ronald Reagan in 1982. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful it passage. People gives don't talk us like context. That like it gives us context to why Cumberland Island, you know, remains complex to manage. I For think sure. they acknowledge that from the very onset. Um, but we also provided three different ways that people can help take action in honor of National Wilderness Month and um, the 60th anniversary of the Wilderness Act to help protect the Cumberland Island wilderness. So one, we suggest that people always remind the Park Service how important wilderness is to them and why it's important and why the agency needs to take seriously its responsibility for future generations. Um, we've got a link on our website. You can personalize your message there. We also encourage you to share with the people you know Um and, and with the ones you don't. So submit an old school letter to the editor, to your <laughs> newspaper. Those, those still yeah. occur. They, I, mean, I don't know if many people realize that. Uh, and social media obviously is the best place to be sharing your love for wilderness. But um, even a postcard to your senator, any of those things I think are an appropriate thing to do to show your love for wilderness. And we're happy to help if anybody needs more suggestions. But then also this month, we're doing our Trivia Night fundraiser. Yes, absolutely. We've been doing this for uh, about two weeks now. We have have two weeks left by the time this episode comes out probably only one week left I yep, think. but every so. wednesday in september uh you can join all of us wilderness fanatics and we can uh quiz <laughs> on leave no trace and cumberland island history and there's a lot i put some ecology. pop culture stuff in yeah. there but we have over five hundred dollars in prizes and you do not have to be an expert on cumberland island to win absolutely right absolutely not so uh, you can wager your bets and win big and walk away with some cool prizes. So if you haven't joined us yet, please make sure you come out to do so. Uh, you could win a walking tour from our friends at Molly's Old South Tours. You could win a, one of those cool new bags from Wendy Barnes Designs, which Wendy are really Barnes awesome. Wendy Barnes always makes incredible um, gear. We've got stickers. We've got hats. We've got swag. Our new bandanas. Merch. like Right. Yeah. Just $10 a week to play at wildcumberland.org. Speaking of our bandana, we announced the release of our 2024 limited edition Stay Wild bandana. It is so cool. It so, really is. Um, our email subscribers were the, the first, first to know, know about that, Absolutely. of course. Absolutely. Uh, we had the honor of collaborating with Danny Lou Illustrates. It's so, people seem to really love it. So oh, yeah. I encourage everybody to go to the market, wildcumberland.org backslash market and get theirs before they're gone. Absolutely. I love mine. I'm going to be wearing it all the time. Well, and your purchases help make our work possible. So. Yes. That being
being said, we also owe a lot of gratitude to our supporters because we had more than 120 people register for our recent virtual learning event on the Blake Plateau. And that is a lot of people. And we were joined by the Georgia Sierra Club and Beth Rems from the Gippel, Georgia Interfaith Power and Light. Right. Um, And we talked a little bit about our interconnectedness and restraint and how no one thing exists alone, right? And we're interdependent. So uh, really unique opportunity to learn about that deep sea coral ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it's now up on YouTube if folks missed it. And I would like to point out the design on your presentation Spot on, Jess. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I had a little help from Canva, but, you know, <laughs> thank you. I, I, in a pinch, I can make do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, um, oh, you can also read, I want to point out, we sure. sent a letter to CEQ Chair Brenda That's Mallory right. Brenda. about the Blake Plateau, and we've posted that, uh, those, that letter, those comments on our website. So you can take action uh, through our website or through um, the resources that Gipple provided in that presentation. But we really want everybody to uh, take some action and help make sure that the Blake Plateau stays protected. For sure, because it affects all of us, right? It does. Now, Jess, you recently had an opportunity to meet with uh, Cumberland Island's new superintendent, Melissa Trenchick, right? The first female superintendent for yes, the seashore, actually. Yes. yes. How did that go? It was good. Um, I think she has direct experience with wilderness and understands the challenges that park units face um, when they're designed like Cumberland, where there may be linear in nature. Mm-hmm. Cumberland is especially complicated <laughs> because it's bisected that linear uh, unit is bisected by a vehicular road now, right? But right. Uh, she inherited a lot of circumstances that's, you know, a lot of things that were already in progress. And mm-hmm. so um, I think I remain hopeful that under her leadership, the park will fulfill its obligations and um, maybe become more focused on natural resource protection and management. So yeah, for sure. I'm hopeful. Now, uh, she also indicated in a recent interview with the Camden County Tribune Georgian that the agency would be issuing a newsletter and getting public input on proposed land swaps, and they've already done that, right? Yeah, it was really fast, actually. Um, The agency announced a 30-day pre-NEPA public comment period on four separate land exchanges for the seashore. So the agency is hosting one public virtual meeting on Thursday, September 19th at six o'clock. Typically the agency records those and makes them available to the public, but they haven't stated if they'll do that for this particular meeting. Um, The comment period ends on October 6th. And so we, Wild Cumberland, sponsored a virtual town hall um, we didn't have a lot of notice. We put it together in about a week. Jess um, killed this. She <laughs> she threw everything together. Fact as best we could. It. As best we could. Uh, well, we wanted to help answer some of the questions that we were getting, in because we've been getting a lot of them, right. and ensure that people were better prepared for that public meeting with the park service. Mm-hmm. Right. I think there was some context, and there is some information that we do not see reflected in that nine page plan that would be helpful and important for the public to consider before they make an official public comment. So yeah. we really urge people, if you miss that discussion, to check it out on YouTube. We have already managed, our volunteers are amazing, and have already managed to get up a recording of that virtual town hall so that you, if you didn't make it, you can rewatch and maybe it'll help guide you for next week. Yeah, and you can uh, view that on our website and on our YouTube channel. Yep, we also posted all the resources there, so all the links we were talking about, all the mm-hmm. documents and all the budgets and all those things. But you Above know, and beyond. <laughs> well, we want people to be prepared. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I think, you know, we, we get asked regularly about a position on this particular issue, and I think we have to respect the original congressional intent that, um, you know, the the island was designed to become an increasingly wilder place, a more ecologically valuable place. Uh, to the Park Service, to Americans, to Georgians, and every parcel of land on the island should have a plan in place to convert to federal ownership. So um, that is our position, and certainly we'll continue to provide information as it becomes available and details uh, related to those exchanges. Hopefully the Park Service will provide some additional information next week. Yeah, certainly not a new stance from us. That's it's yeah, kind of always been our really purpose, Yeah, I don't think people really expected anything different. <laughs> right, I mean... Um, Thank you for saying that. Yes, I hope nobody has really expected anything (laughs) different out of us, actually. Now, uh, Superintendent Trenchick 
alluded to changes to visitor parking as well for the seashore in the same Tribune article, right? Yeah. Um, the quote is, another of Trenchick's first task is working out parking for the ferry that is convenient for visitors, but doesn't cause problems with visitors in the historic district. She said money for the effort is expected in the next federal budget. Now, for many visitors, the dirt slash sand, sand. parking lot, right? <laughs> is critical to the primitive visitor experience for, for us visiting the island. Right? I mean, it sort of starts there. Like yeah. the moment you open your doors and there's Spanish mosque hanging into your car, it right? It puts like, you in the mood. Yeah, <laughs> it sets the scene. I now, speaking to you directly, Jess, do you find the parking inconvenient for island visitors? I think it's a very short walk. It's a very easy process. Um, I think that no, I don't find it inconvenient. I'm wondering if locals feel the same, you know, because they visit the island too. I mean, are local businesses currently negatively affected by the parking lot? The foot traffic right. from the parking lot across the street. Right. I, I mean, I know that they obviously have encountered issues with visitors blocking up parking in the historic district. Um, while on the island. While on the island sure. for an extended period of time. So campers, you know, you can't park right there in the historic district and take up spots for mm -hmm. three or four days, right? You need yeah. to be in the dirt parking lot. Um, but I, I've never really felt like, I've never heard feedback from other local businesses or local residents that, that the volume of traffic mm -hmm. from the seashore affects or impedes. I feel like it's always been a boon to the historic district to have people like shopping and, and having to you know, kind of interface with those retail stores and yeah. opportunities there. But um, I'd be interested to hear. We have our speak pipe yes, on our web we page. Do. So if anybody out there has feedback about it being a negative experience, I'd really like to hear it. Um, it's interesting. Or a positive I, experience. You can write in, voice in, whatever. The Just only thing I can say, and maybe I should address this with the seashore first, but I'd noticed on my last trip that a woman did try to park in the handicapped parking in the historic district to go over for the day on the ferry. Mm. And they asked her to move her car because she was going to be parked more than two hours. Right. And she, obviously the, the park does not have any specific handicapped parking mm -hmm. available. So it may that be, could be a, an area of opportunity for them. Right. Right. But yeah. you would think that there's enough handicapped parking available in the historic district that the seashore, I mean, I don't know, though. Yeah. They did put in the motorized wheelchairs recently, so maybe they have a need or plans to make handicapped parking more accessible. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, but yeah, something we'll that probably should be addressed. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in the same news article, still on the, the Trenchick News It was article, one of the right? first it interviews was. she'd done, yeah, I think. Yeah, for sure. So there was a lot to cover eager, in that. Yeah. So um, in the same news article, she also stated that the use of the Grange Building, which reverted to federal ownership 14 years ago. 14. <laughs> 14 is uh, still to be determined, right? Yeah, God, I can't believe it's been 14 years. Um, but apparently it received its its final round of funding. I think it was the third allocation of funding to right. restore or repair the building. And it was something like almost two and a half million dollars, according <laughs> to the 22 Green Book, I think, uh, which is the park budget. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I haven't seen a lot of action over there yet. And 14 years. 14 years. Also, the parking changes, the Grange, the Seacap Ranger station renovation, none of these proposed plans have been released to the public, uh, nor were they reflected in or available for consideration in uh, the 2022 visitor bump. use management right. plan. You're right. Yeah. So there are a lot of other independent projects and initiatives that I think have to be considered in context, right? Even the, the, they're about to do a, a bank stabilization project at Plum Orchard, but it's going to require weekly road maintenance for them to get the equipment up and down the road on the mm. island. And I think the public, most of the public is unaware that they're going to be encountering that when they're camping and, right. and hiking. Wild Cumberland is staffed entirely by volunteers. We say that a lot, often in passing, but we want to make sure our listeners understand what that really means. Our team members donate their time, effort, and talents to help ensure that Cumberland Island and its wilderness remain protected. Every volunteer can find a place with us. We invite you to sign up to staff Wild Cumberland events, contribute to the organization's social media, assist in grant writing, and much more. 
Join us at wildcumberland.org and help make a difference for the next generation. Speaking of VUMP and things not included in VUMP. Oh, the issue that keeps... <laughs> <laughs> the issue that keeps coming back, right? There have been some updates and significant media coverage relating to the island's feral horses. So in late August, plaintiffs in the Cumberland Island feral horse litigation submitted an emergency petition to the court requesting immediate intervention and care for the island's horse population. Yeah, this is, I mean, in layman's terms, I guess, I think the best way to explain this is that the plaintiffs are asking the U.S. District Court Judge Sarah Garrity to order the Park Service to provide food and water for the horses until she rules on the litigation, right? Right. But the Department of Justice came back and said, basically, the judge can't rule on that yet because they want her to, you know, rule to dismiss the whole thing. Yeah. And so it's sort of moot to provide water and food for starving animals until she decides if they should stay or go. When in doubt, pass the book, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's frustrating to, as a taxpayer, as, you know, the leader of this organization to sit back and see the federal government just sort of throw its hands up and, Mm -hmm. you know, continue to let these animals suffer and, and the seashore be degraded because they just don't want to come up with a solution. Right. But, um, we'll see. I think it falls a little short of the values that I expect the National Park Service to uphold and to you know, when you think about their responsibility to ensure that our resources are unimpaired, mm-hmm. there's that word that they use a lot. Yeah. Um, for future generations, there's they have work to do. Certainly they so do. I would say it. Yeah. Our volunteers also graciously and oh, generously yeah. donated their time to create a video that helps explain the feral horses of Cumberland Island. So if you missed it, you can view it on our YouTube now. Um, so much has happened in the last 30 days. I almost forgot about that somehow in the shuffle, but yeah, that video was a really, I hope it did the issue justice and I appreciate if people will share it. I think it did. Uh, I mean, we hope that you're inspired to share this with others. Um, as we've said before, and we'll say again, we believe that most, if not all of the islands management issues would be resolved with the development and implementation of a wilderness management plan. Yep. And we've got a new form up on our website associated with that. So if you haven't gone through and personalized that and sent it to the park service, please take this opportunity to do so. It's been 42 years, right? 42 years since the wilderness was established. And I do think it is our responsibility to hold the agency accountable to fulfilling its responsibility. Right. Right. Our yeah, volunteers so. included a whole bunch of stuff in this newsletter, too, for just, like, fun reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and we linked to a second article in the press about Cumberland Island's new superintendent, right? Yep. There was this article about dolphins with elevated mercury levels along our coast, which for Yikes. people who consume a lot of seafood mm-hmm. may find that research interesting or valuable. And then pollinators being in decline. And, and I think the headline was even in the national park system, oh, which yeah. I think, don't think anybody should be surprised. Right. But, um, it's and then there was thing. this last thing, which was recreation.gov. Did you see? They've made some changes. So apparently there are ways uh, you can receive an alert if a ticket holder cancels a reservation and you mm-hmm. needed that spot. So Oh, that's going to be great for visitors on Cumberland Island, it's right? it's not working on Cumberland. No, <laughs> and it doesn't work for regularly scheduled releases. So it's not like you can say, well, I know I want to book on December 19th. Will you notify mm-hmm. me when... Right. That opens. This so, is only when people cancel, right? Well, right. And it's and it's not for us mm. either way. Yeah. But yeah. maybe we can look forward to something like that in the future. Maybe one day. Interesting to see that some changes are being done to recreation.gov given the criticism they've received for years now about yeah. how they handle um, reservations and fees in particular. There's a lot going on on Little Cumber or Little Cumberland Island. I don't want to say Little Cumberland Island. No, that's, that's a confusing. different one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So, but there's, there's a lot, a lot going, going on on, on Cumberland. <laughs> <laughs> the National Park Foundation also announced. I think everybody saw this. The largest grant it's ever received. I think it was a hundred million dollars. Wow. Um, and they've allocated those funds into four priority areas. So I'm very curious to see if Cumberland Island might benefit from any of these initiatives because they were inspiring the next generation of park stewards, conserving and preserving threatened parks and wildlife, 
ensuring a world class visitor experience, <laughs> which I I'm not world so class sure about that one. But then uh, telling a more complete story of America, which I find to be especially intriguing. Interesting. So we'll see what they do with that. I'd love to see some of that trickle down to our site. For sure. So we know how valuable your time is. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks for choosing to spend some of it with us. Yep. Stay wild. Well, Cumberland is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and all donations are tax deductible. Learn more and take action at wildcumberland.org. The Wild Cumberland Podcast is produced by Vertical River, and this episode was edited by Greg Cusson.